You're listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design decks for tournament play. We put our creation to the test and share our findings on the air. Today we discuss the first results and brews in the modern format with cards from the Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle Earth. Will this be a joyful 111st birthday? A disturbing trek through the dead marshes? Oh no. Precious. It all starts right now. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I was waiting for Suck to start, but he didn't, and we never agreed. So here I am, introducing myself and my beloved partner, Zachary. How are you doing, Zach? Uh, fantastic. Well, you've been around uh, more consistently than I have, and uh, you've done a lot more intros than I have, so I thought I would leave it to the professional uh, while we're here. Um, and we are back with another wonderful episode of Faithless Brewing. We're going to be talking all about the sort of first impressions impacts of the lord of the rings set in the modern format and i couldn't be more excited to be talking about this with specifically you oh uh, as this was a very similar thing to our very first podcast together ever oh yeah a hundred percent i'm super excited to be here with you i'm afraid our ceo had to drop at the last minute so it's just the two of us they told us to go below an hour we both know we cannot accomplish that and we have a ton of sweet bills I'm super excited for this yeah. set, like, for the first time in months. I don't know why. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that kind of snuck up on me about how excited I would be about it. Uh, I think I just had to start playing with some of the cards and seeing uh, how well or interestingly or excitingly or whatever they do, slotting in to the modern format. Uh, of course, we have been part of a wonderful group of brewers and, and uh, people who contribute to the Faithless Brewing content uh, on the Discord, um, so we got to shout out our wonderful Discord and all the people there who uh, encourage us to keep doing this, encourage each other to keep brewing and playing awesome decks. And uh, if you want access to that, you can, of course, do so by uh, supporting us on Patreon at Faithless Brewing, patreon.com slash Faithless Brewing. We have a new patron, Arno P. Arno P. Arno uh, however your name is pronounced. Thank you so much. Um, when you join our Patreon, you support the show, you get access to the Discord, you get other fun perks like merch, and um, you know you can uh, comment on a bunch of things, uh, things you're excited to see from the upcoming episodes, um, just like this one right here. This beautiful episode where I'm going to say that the moment that triggered me into really needing to get going with the set was when randomly Shanna told me, you know Orgish Master has Flash, right? Uh, yeah, I I think I saw that interaction happen. Um, someone said to you, someone said the words Esper Flash, and you were off to the races. I didn't realize so many cards had Flash, and that was a slippery slope in just having to consider other cards I had forgotten just to play new stuff, and I'm on a slippery slope of brewing. Every single brew becomes worse than the last. Yeah. I, I would suggest that what we're going to do is hit um, the list of cards uh, with decks here in okay. reverse order, starting with Sam, and we should work our way up. All right. Um, but as a jump to the end, a spoiler of the last card we're going to talk about, um, there is an update on the bounty on the one ring. There has been at least a $2 million bounty yeah. placed on the one ring. That's the um, minimum we have heard publicly. So if you open the one ring, keep it safe, get it to someone, and your $2 million, and don't throw it on a volcano. Absolutely. I mean, unless you really want to, but make sure you get multiple angles uh, of video for the social media clout. Um, but anyway, uh, aside from the One Ring, which we will get to and I'm very excited about, let's start off with a creature combo card. Uh, Mord, who is Samwise Gamgee? And why do I care? Why do I care? Well, there's two sums in this set. Surprisingly, I'm going to talk about both today. Ooh. But we're going to start with the, with the good one. The best one. With Samwise Gamgee. A green and a white, two mana, two, two mana, two, two halfling peasant. Whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield, made a food token... And sacrifice three foods, return target historic card from your graveyard to your hand. Artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are historic. So I saw some, and it 
At first, I, at first sight, it reminded me of a Lonis, but better with the synergies of the deck and on better colors. Lonis. Yeah, it's all... also not limited to once per turn. Is Lonis limited? I don't to think once Lonis is. No, Lonis isn't. Maybe it's right. not. Yeah, it's just. Yeah. She's just that one. Maybe it was of a the two non. Two. Yeah, maybe it was the non-token part that on Lonis was like, oh, what do you do with this? You can't really do that much with it. Yeah, and for some reason. It's not only the fact that it's a 2-2, two -two, it's not only the fact that it's white instead of blue, and it's the second ability is so much better than the one on Lonis, that immediately I wanted to play this in something that in, instead of that in a game objects deck. And then I was told, and I just found online, the sacrifice combo. Samwise plus a Cauldron Familiar plus any Sack Outlet nets you infinite damage because you sacrifice the card, it comes back, you sacrifice a food, get it back. In the battlefield, makes a food. You sacrifice it, and you just loop the one damage infinitely. Yeah, so that's a three-card combo, right? It's Samwise, the Cauldron Familiar, and then any free repeatable sack outlet. So the yeah. ones that people have been using so far are Viscera Seer and uh, maybe a uh, Carrion Feeder. I have seen Goblin Bombardment as well. Oh, yeah. Yep, that makes sense, too. It does stretch you into a fourth color, uh, but that's yeah. certainly... Uh, not a bad card to have in this kind of deck in general. Yeah, likely the best card. It's likely the best card, but at the cost of being the most of color one. Right, and two mana and an enchantment. Yeah, um, yeah. So well, the the uh, the card type is important in my opinion because when all the combo pieces are creatures, it means you can play all creature tutors. You can play great cards like Finale of Devastation or Collected Company. First build, I went into Absan, tried to play the game objects with Collected Company, got a 3-2. We decided, okay, let's try it for another round. We we're playing four Collected Company, four Tutors. And we were also playing, of course, because we we're playing Coco, we we're playing Sam, Gilded Goose, Prosperous Innkeeper, Kala Greeters, Chatterfang, Academy Manufacturer, of course, and more importantly, the Rosy Cordon Screwy Oak combo. Rosie Cordon being Sam's wife, completely fitting for this scenario. Yep, absolutely. They just score, they just score beautifully into like sometimes. Sometimes she just went like turn two, Sam turn three, Rosie. She entered the battlefield, made a food. Sam makes a food and Sam attacks for four. Rosie makes threats in this deck. But Rosie combos with Curio because whenever Curio makes a token, makes a squirrel, Rosie puts a counter on it and it loops infinitely until you decide to just put the counter on somewhere else. Yeah. So this gave you an infinite 1 1 combo that you could hit off Collected Company at instant speed. Yeah, it's very similar to. It was like. It wasn't Civic Wayfinder, but there's a 4 mana creature that combos with four mana three, to three, do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, Civic something. It's from a Ravnica set. Whenever a creature, um, there's a, whenever a green creature enters the battlefield, you put a counter or something like that. It's the one that's like a farmer with a green background. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, this is a, a much improved version of that combo, if only because you can hit both chunks on a collected company. Um, and then Chatterfang, for those who don't remember this card particularly well, it's a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three legendary creature squirrel warrior, and the relevant lines of text are uh, if you're creating tokens, you get that many 1-1 uh, one, one green squirrels. Uh, and then the secret text that Mord was completely destroying people with is uh, a single black sacrifice X squirrels target creature gets plus X minus X until end of turn. So it's a very efficient removal spell. Like, really good if you're producing a reasonable number of squirrels. Yeah, sometimes curves like turn two, some turn three, Chatterfang make a 1-1, one, one, you to sacrifice to kill something. Or whenever you your Chatterfang manages to survive, if you got a, an Academy Manufacturer on board, you just won the game. You would just make infinite 1-1s one, and be able to clear literally anything your opponent does. Also, Scary Oak makes squirrels. Yes, yeah, yeah. So nice little layered synergy there. So how did all of that go for you as a, in a general sense? Because you had the 3-2 on the first one. And a 3-2 on the second, on the second one. one, and a 3-2 yeah. on the third one, where we finally decided to go off have sun, forget the black combo play, go f um, all in on Celestia game objects. And we got okay. a final 3-2, but this one we actually faced tier 1 discs. Like, if we had faced with the other versions, we would not have beat we were not have beaten. Right. So... And so this is just using Sam as a way to generate game objects, but also... This is Sam as a better Lonis effect, but also that's not only a better Lonis effect because she's on Celestia. Yeah. But also the second ability buys back not only Manufacturer, but also Ursa Saga. And, and 
it is the best usage of food that yeah. I have ever seen for a deck like this. Oftentimes with Manufacture, you're making clues, you're making treasures. Okay, both those game objects are very easily usable. Food is is good for uh, Asmo, right? Yeah. But if you're not playing Asmo, what are you doing with the food? Usually nothing. Um, maybe you have Urza to make use of those uh, as mock sapphires, but really you kind of end up with this one category of game object that's like, Growing very go clearly that's just growing not your as good. Ghost trucks. Yeah, exactly. It's just hanging out, and um, Samwise turning that into cardboard, and and specifically like the cards they're trying to kill. Yeah, uh, that seems really good. I that seems a, like a great. I had a lot of scenarios where my opponent, I had a manufacturer on board and a Sam, and my opponent was forced to kill the Sam before manufacturer. <laughs> right, just coming to lady alive, that's... and it was insane. That never happens right. with Lonis. Correct. Yeah, Lonis's uh, activated ability was very poor. Uh, it's not even worth bringing back up because it's just it's just not great. Um, so overall, how did you feel like you know the Sam was affecting these decks that you made? Obviously, the non combo version was just as good as the combo version. Did you find the combo versions were comboing frequently or efficiently? Or you've played a lot of decks similar to this, so yeah. So what's the comparison between these and those and these no, and maybe this was um, the, like Heliod? I think these might have been the best. Um, Coco deck I have played in a while. The deck actually felt powerful. I think Galagriters is the worst card in the deck, and if I was taking another iteration of this, I would try to remove that. Scurry Oak, Rosy Coron was powerful. They are n Scurry Oak is the worst card of both. Rosy Coron being a 1-1 one -one that makes a food when it enters the battlefield, that's actually great when you have Academy or Shatterfang out. And playing Rosy Coron plus any other creature in this deck puts you in a good spot. She needs another creature, like she's not an amazing standalone, but she's super powerful in synergies due to being both an ETB and a, just growing your stuff. You sometimes just won games by having a manufacturer playing like a Rosie hitting for f and start hitting for 5 or 6 damage every turn with your manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because it just gained plus 3, plus 3 with any, with any trigger. So, Rosie was great. Scurry Oak sucks. Scurry Oak never did anything besides comboing, so that's a bit tough. I also saw a bunch of situations where you comboed with it, and you're like, well, here I go, passing the turn, I sure hope I don't die, and then you died. Yep. And it was like, right, yeah, uh, hmm, cool. Also, I managed to beat Burn, like, th four times in three leagues. Yeah, matchup. Um, Burn, Burn has been popular right now, so if anything you're testing has a good Burn matchup, I would test that first. Um, that has been one thing that's been popping up frequently for me, um... Then we have our good friend Freak You Nasty, who this was the first card from the set that he was interested in brewing. Um, I love this guy. He's just a great streamer. So if you check out Freak You, the letter U, Nasty, spelled exactly how you'd think. And there's links to his deck list here in the show notes. Um, so he is a, a brewer I, I, and a friend who I like to keep an eye on anything he's doing. So he tried two different uh, Asmo food variations with Sam, uh, playing the Carrion Feeder, Visser Seer, Cauldron Familiar sort of kill package. Um, he did a straight Abzan version, and then um, did he play... I don't know if he's played on stream yet a version that he had with... Fable the Mirror Breaker going to four colors. No, it doesn't look like the, that one's posted here yet. But just two different versions of Ab Abzan Samwise combo um, with Asmo in the deck. Um, one version had uh, Ranger Captain of Eos uh, that finds Asmo, Cauldron Familiar, uh, Carrion Feeder, Viscera Seer. So a lot of your sort of powerful one and zero drops. Um, Serenth Steelseeker, phenomenal card for these yeah. kind of decks. Um, binning Cauldron Familiar uh, is a great way to get that piece of your combo going. Um, and then, of course, Finale of Devastation doesn't mind um, if you're one of Carrion Feeder and one of Viscera Seer end up in the graveyard. Finale of Devastation can grab them out of there. He's also playing an Unearth so, uh, and some Feasting troll kings to sort of hmm. tie it all together so with the kind of very reasonable food asmo mid-range plan um with this creature combo floating in the middle of it yeah i base myself a tiny bit on on freaking nasty's list but i went a little bit bit less etb value of my artifacts i was not playing settings and i was not running feasting troll king mm -hmm. yeah yeah i went all i just went all in on the 
Cauldron Familiar, Viscera Seer. Oh, and the card I'm playing at his end is a playset of Gilded Goose. And a card he's playing that you weren't in some of your versions is Urza Saga, but it seems like you've sort of corrected that. Because the first one was Absan Coco, and it called it a 4-2-1 Saga. But once we, we sure, said, sure. screw the cat combo, we're playing Game Object, the Celestia version with Saga felt great. Painless mana, Ursa Saga value. Sam is a bit annoying with Ursa Saga at times. You really want to make turn to Saga in this sort of decks, and Sam can clank that up. Yeah. But it hasn't been that big of an issue so far, and Gilded Goose or Asmo Lines really opened that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things of... There is a lot... So I've played against this uh, myself. They were playing an Asmo version, but they were also playing uh, Grist in that deck. Not mm -hmm. for any particular reason. It's just a good card. Yeah, like, Grist, is, a great Grist is a great card. It's a great um, r r the rock card if you're playing creatures in your deck. Right, exactly, and it just it was just another thing that I had to deal with in games and made it you know difficult to play around. So I think there's going to be a lot of variations of these decks, and uh, it's really going to be a time will tell who can kind of make the best version of the, the Rubik's Cube that is this kind of creature combo deck. You know, you're always having to try to solve it. You're always trying to have to... Um, make the right tutor package, pick the right tutor cards. Um, is Eladomri's call a card you want to play? Is you Do you want to be a Coco deck? Do you want to be a Ranger Captain deck? Do you want to be... There's so many things. Yeah, I, I, It's one of those things where I look at these decks and I go, D does this also want to play some number of like Heliod combo? Y you could. I mean, it's not insane, right? Especially if you're a Coco deck already. Um, so, time will tell if what all of this is doing is uh, at the right speed for the modern format. Yeah, surprise Sam is seeing so much play. I thought I was going to be the only one excited, but I'm happy to see everyone on the boat. Yeah, there's lots of creature combo enthusiasts, and it's always nice to see, isn't it? <laughs> all, devoted, they, all, all devoted Druid lovers for Ice to the occasion. Yeah. Uh, next up. We've got Forge Anew, um, a card that people sort of thought maybe is going to be maybe a sideboard card or maybe see some main deck play in Hammer Time. I have heard there are some Hammer Time players who are very excited about this card, so it's two and a white for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. As long as it's your turn, you may activate equip abilities anytime you could cast an instant. And you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate during each of your turns. So that last line for me is the real thing that makes it like, okay, maybe this is a contention for main deck hammer time. Um, one of the limiting factors in hammer time is not the ability to find hammers. They have a lot of ways to do that. In fact, most lists aren't even playing as many as they can. There's just too many ways to find hammers. But the equippers... The uh, Sigarda's Aids and uh, um, Pure Steel Paladins of the world. We've kind of got a eight count of the best versions of that effect, and it's not insane to me to want maybe a ninth and tenth uh, version of that, and Forge Anew does fit nicely into that niche um, while doing a couple of other things that are unique. Yeah, it has a couple of fun synergies. I have run into this card quite a bit the last couple of days, mostly in Boros, surprisingly. Yeah, so we have a Boros list here. It's always um, in Boros. Yeah, that, that, that's the Boros list. But I have been running in, like, hammer, in Boros Hammer, stuff like that. Like the usual. Yeah, um, this is playing uh, Ragavan uh, alongside Esper Sentinel and Portable Hole as your one-drops. And then some uh, Saga targets. We've got some Stoneforge Mystics and some Goblin Engineers. Goblin Engineer, of course, sets up uh, an artifact for your Forge Anew to grab. So that's an excellent little sort of synergistic sequence of turn two Goblin Engineer, turn three Forge Anew. Um, there's a one of Brea's Apprentice, one of Crucible of Worlds, one of Nettlesis. So Goblin Engineer, of course, can put those in and then weld them back out. Uh, we've got two of Sarah Paragon, who could play out anything that costs three or less, but of course can just keep playing your fetch lands. And all the way at the top, we've got a Batter Skull and a Cauldre Complete, sort of as your big boom boom payoff uh, equipments that you bury with the Goblin Engineer and then bring back with the Forge Anew. Um, so this is a very interesting list. My primary concern is uh, it's just a numbers thing here. Like, this just feels like this can't possibly be as good as Hammer Time, and then it's also probably not as good as, like, Urza's Thopter Sword combo, which it sort of 
<laughs> has some similarities too, if that makes sense so to you. So I think you're a um, lot less weaker to like s strong artifact hate, like Force of Vigor or Boseju Brennan sure. 6. You're playing a lot more quality cards that are just not weak to that sort of effect. Mostly I was trying to exploit Force of New. It's also possible, it just isn't good enough. But I really like the interaction of something like turn 1 is percentile, turn 2 Goblin Engineer, turn 3 Force of New hits you for 10. Sorry, for 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is that is powerful. I'm not saying that there isn't uh, powerful sequences here. There absolutely are. Yeah. Yeah, but in the end, it might just be a 9 tenth piece of Hammer Equip for Hammer, because that's how, that's how Hammer is, right? If you, if yeah, you see good I mean, it's cards, just ridiculous. they go in hammer. Worth noting for I, everyone I, playing against this, the Caldra complete for Shanyu interaction. Yes. Sh you're a, you're a shot suck. You, you want to take this one? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if it's what you're thinking of, yeah. uh, that if you have a Caldra complete and a Forge new in play, if they try to remove any creature that you have, you just instantly oh, no. move the Caldra over. It wasn't that okay, one. I have, no, I have no idea what you're talking oh, about. Oh, so if you attack, let's say I attack you with an Esper Sentinel and a Caldra. Oh, oh, yeah. you're talking, okay, yes, okay, now I know what you're talking about. So if you have a creature that has the Caldra complete equipped, uh, it deals damage in the first strike uh, damage phase because it has first strike. Uh, then when that damage is finished, but before normal combat, you can move the culture complete over to another creature, which will get the plus five, plus five bonus. Um, that creature now has first strike, but the wording of combat damage is such that uh, if a creature has first strike, even if it didn't, uh, or sorry, if it didn't deal damage during the first strike phase, then it does deal damage during the regular combat phase. So basically, you first strike with the Caldra, you move it to something else, that something else is going to get the plus five, plus five. Um, and this applies for any creature that has first strike with any piece of equipment. Yeah. So if you had a creature that naturally had first strike and say it had a Colossus Hammer on it, you could deal the damage there, then move the hammer onto a creature that doesn't have first strike and get the bonus. Exactly. Yeah. So that can allow yeah, you that's for a, a super fast clock, and it's I'm fortunate you plus Caldra is something that's bound to happen. I have seen people the other day. I saw, I think it was no, it wasn't Spike. I don't know who I was seeing that Casta thought sees discards a Caldra after a opponent plays a Stoneforge, and two draws later opponents go, oh, Fortune you Caldra. Yeah. Yeah, and that's explosive on the first turn because, like, you, you hit them for five with this cauldron that they didn't know was coming and then move it on to any other creature that's attacking get another five. Yeah, so that's what you were talking about with uh, Forge a New plus Cauldra for a ten damage swing. Yeah. Um, I might be interested in this deck playing Lightning Bolts over Portable Hole or something like that just to get some extra reach in here. Um, and it almost definitely should be playing one copy of Hammer, right? I think it's insane not to play one copy of Colossus Hammer in this deck. You have Sagas, you have the Forge of News. It just, it seems wrong to me not to have a single copy of Hammer at minimum. Yeah, maybe it's just, because it's free, right? Forge of News, Stone Forge, it's yeah. bound to happen. Right, exactly. Oh, it's yeah, like, but that. one, one, because you can Saga for it, you can Stone Forge Mystic for it, and there's just going to be a bunch of times where you're like, I want to you know, you 15. go... Yeah, exactly. You go like Stone Forge into Culture Complete, and then the next turn you're like, "Well, I have a Forge of New. I don't have anything to do with it." But you're like, "Oh, but my Saga's gonna go <coughs> off in a turn or two. Now, all of a sudden, it grabs me a Hammer. Smash. Probably my my first inclination would be over the Chromatic Star since that seems unnecessary here. Yeah, it's a bit too greedy. Yes, I mean it's it's just too cute. But it was in the original deck list, so I wanted to not forget it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, uh, Forge New, something definitely to keep our eyes on if it manages to stay in the modern format. The next card, though, I think is Oof. something that I'm really excited to see if it can make a meaningful impact in modern because it's it's a tough question. It really, really is. Um, this card is a slam dunk for Legacy and Vintage for sure Yeah. Um, in terms of can it do things. I don't know if those things are going to be good enough in that format, but it definitely does stuff. We're talking about Orcish Bowmasters and Mord. You take me away on this one because I really think that you're the one who's going to be playing with this a little bit more. All right, so Orcish Bowmasters. A card I have yet to see someone cast. I have yet to see it in the stack in any game of. Yeah, I, I haven't either. Um, the reason, the main reason why is I don't think it's a great brewing card. Like, there's not, uh, I, especially for modern, there's no great way to, like, set your opponent up to be punished by this. 
right? You're, you're not forcing opponents to draw cards. One of the few ways to do it is, uh, it's that, uh, uh, burning impulse? No, burning inquiry, burning inquiry. Burning inquiry, yeah. Yeah, so if you want to play Hollow Vine with this, I can imagine that being a thing. But other than that, there's not a lot of ways to force your opponent to draw that you're happy to play uh, in Modern. And so that means you're relying on them to do it for you. So that's why I'm saying, like, I, there's not a lot of people who are shelling out the yeah. 50 to 70 tickets per copy that this is right now. And again, 28, 28. That, it has gone down. Well, no, it has. It has. Sorry. But, I mean, those, that's what it was in the first couple days, right? Hmm. Um but anyway, that was that's I think that's mostly based on legacy and vintage. So yeah, we haven't really seen it on the stack yet, but I'm excited to see it. So take us through the card. All right, so two mana one one, a black and one for a sadly not goblin but orc archer. Sad. <laughs> yeah. Goblin yeah. players cry in shambles in tears. So one one flash when it enters the battlefield, and whenever an opponent draws a card except the first one they draw in each of the draw steps. So this isn't the same text as Narset, it's the same one as Notion Thief. So even a consider on an, on your turn will give you a trigger, which is deal one damage to any target, then amass orcs one. So deal one damage to any target, self-explanatory ping, amass orcs one, back to the old me mechanic from Ravnica? War of the Spark? Uh, War of the Spark, yeah. War of the Spark, where the first time it triggers, you make an orc army and Whenever you have an orc army, instead of making a new one, you put a plus one plus one counter on it. So first time it triggers, you make a zero zero, put a, pl a plus one counter, and every single time it will add counters or make a new one depending on if you have an army or not. So based that line, this is best effect, best raise the alarm ever existed. Two mana, two, two, two mana, two bodies, and a ping to any target with yeah. flash. And it's and it's a creature. That's yeah. yeah. That's so much better than an instant. I mean, we had like, we had the creature, we had the white one, but this is literally just strictly better. Uh, resolute reinforcements, but that's what. I, but but you only just got that, and yeah. now black gets a better version. Yeah, what? that's devastating for white. White in shambles. Black still worst color in modern. Maybe the bowmasters can help us. But this was a nice little toy for them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I was super excited about this card just as a value card. I could see myself playing it in some shells whenever I was playing something grindy. And then all of a sudden I get a message in Mana Simulator Switch saying, How, what, what, what do we think about Bowmasters and Sam in Flash? And I was like, wait, they have Flash. Yep, sure do. And I went back to the last deck I was really showing growing before I went back to Four Color, which was the Four Color Flash build that, that I was consistently doing quite well with, but it was missing something, Ragavan was an issue. And then all of a sudden, I remember we have like the best two mana flash creature printed in the last five years in this set. And then a pretty good one on the two mana slot as well. Yeah, yeah. Orcation Monster being an amazing get, allows you to kill your opponent's stuff. This deck always plays a flash priest, so you can really get some value out of it having flash. Playing it off the top with Giara, um, getting a draw with Cedar Wisp. This really helps us maximize the amount of card with actual flash in our deck because we got a great playset or at least two or three copies of something good. That's zero removal, zero ping, kills early Ragavan, early Darcy, early Mana Dorks, stuff you had to kill but was unavailable previously without Solitude Pitch. Yeah, and I will definitely say that uh, Ragavan DRC decks are going to be the bread and butter of this card being playable. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the time, one of the things is that they set up a Mishra's Bobble and you can punish them for that by flashing in the Orc Archer, and there's nothing they can do to stop that card draw. They also play things like Consider, uh, which actually draw a card in the early game. Um, so that's definitely one of the decks where it's like, if this isn't good enough against that, then it's definitely a rough a rough go for Orcish Bowmasters. So I hope it's his play. A bit sad it doesn't kill the new Mana Orc, which is ironic how much I have been saying how great the new Mana Orc doesn't die to Brennan Six Ping. Mm -hmm. I am the author of my own destruction. I mean, yeah, but this one can do it on its own, right? Like, if they, if they somehow draw an extra card uh, they... against Yogmoth, yeah. this is a house. And I do not want to be the player who gets in Yogmoth v. Yogmoth fights where there's Orcish Bowmasters, hmm. like, hanging out in those deck lists. I don't know how many copies are going to be in there, but they'll be there. They will be there. So the other two drops that this deck won now that they're here is the other Sam, which is Samwise the Stout Hearted. So some boys have top card, one and a white yeah. for a two mana two one halfling peasant with flash. When it enters the battlefield, choose up to one target pen run that was put into a graveyard this turn and return it to your hand. Then the ring tempts you. 
Their intent to you is mostly flavor decks, but two mana, two one, get back a fetch land, get back something with flash is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an enter the battlefield, doesn't require being cast, or created ephemerate returning two stuff. It's a bit wonky in the upkeep, but can work with fetch lands or such. Card has at least looks as a pretty great payoff, or at least secondary way to get back a solitude, to get back your solitude value. What does this make me think of? Um... Renegade Rallyer. Renegade Rallier. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. it's like a pseudo. It's so Renegade Rallier. This is very reminiscent of Rally, Renegade Rallier to me, except with Flash, right? Yeah, it's like a slower Rallier because it's back to your hand, not to the battlefield. Then it would be insane if it mm. was to the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, but it's still reminiscent of Renegade yeah. Rallier. Uh, when I look at this list of yours, I will say uh, I'm not the biggest fan, and I know this came up before, but like I just don't feel like Ice Fang really needs to be here. Uh, and almost definitely... Yeah, I know. That we have too many two drops, I think we can keep the Ice Fang. But I will see how it works. Sure. Like, the mana was working, and the mana that we added is actually helpful because we added a few more black pips in the early game, and we had a lot of scenarios where we had double black and not a single black card in our hand besides Slither Wisp. Sure. That's definitely a thing. And I also don't know if you need to play four Slither Wisps, and I don't know if you need to play three Aaron Giada. Um, it is important in this kind of deck to have something that's like a card advantage engine. So that's maybe, maybe it's fine, but I'm just, I'm just pointing out that like you definitely need something that starts like consistently generating card advantage because man, uh, our decks, like even decks, you wouldn't expect mono red mid range, mono red mid range generates so much card advantage. It's absurd. Mono red mid range. I have seen pictures of M Hayashi beating four color on the back of milling him out. Yeah. Yeah, it, it happens all the time if you play it right. Uh, but here's the thing. If you cut Ice Fang, then you can go down to Esper. Then you can play four Ephemerates, four Subtlety, and you can call this Esper Scam. And then you can get a lot of internet clout, as far as I understand how the system works. All right. I'm missing a card. Should I just start like the fourth Spell Setter Sprite or, for, or third Force of Negation? Like full on anti combo yeah, screw some, it. Some, yeah, yeah. Uh, third Force of Negation is more of a scam play, right? Yeah. So I would say. Do just that. call it Scam. Yeah. And four subtleties is not a bad thing with Slither Wisp, right? No, no, like, it is. It never is. And four ephemerates is not bad with everything else that this deck is doing. You can ephemerate an Orcish Bowmasters get an extra ping. Um, so that's even worth doing. Uh, I also cannot imagine what the board starts looking like with two Orcish Bowmasters. Uh, that that yeah. could get really out of hand. Yeah, I, I should. Uh, I have never played it. I should try ephemerate a Bowmasters. The fact that it's... Like, for the first time in my lifetime, I'm playing an Esper deck with Reach. Like, instead, Bone Masters and uh, Ephemerate, it's a ball to the face. It's like the worst mm -hmm. there, Snapcaster Bolt. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I feel like I would be remiss without um, saying that, like, yes, there have been blue-black um, control decks that have existed in Modern with the end game of, like, Narset and Gyre Reach. Um, they'll use cards like Liliana the Veil to um, push it, push the game into a low resource state where suddenly um, Gyre Reach plus Narset is locking them out. And those decks do often play cards that force your opponents to draw cards, so Bowmaster could be kind of okay in that kind of deck. But the thing is, it's not popular, it's not particularly powerful. Yes, it's a space you could brew in. Uh, you can't use Days Undoing with Orcish Bowmasters because Days Undoing, unless you're flashing it. So unless you're unless you have a Teferi. Yeah, yeah, um, but it's tough. Yeah, it's it's so that means you need to use one of the more expensive versions. There's the uh, the six mana version that flashes back for three. Um, Let's not talk back. Oh yeah, um, Echo Fions. Yeah, Echo Fions. That's right. So. Yes, it's possible to brew with Orcish Bowmasters. In modern, I don't think any of those things are worthwhile. And also, that's not really what the card is meant to do. No, I think um, it's a. F I think it's one of the most fair, powerful two drops we have seen in a while. Mm -hmm. It's. I don't know. I just think people. If you try to combo with it, I think it might be going too far. I think we just call it an amazing two drop and deal with that. Yeah, uh, <sighs> it's a great answer for and thing to have on the board against Esper Sentinel. Um, and again, pretty much any of the Ragavan DRC decks because they're always going to be playing Bobble. And then if they're playing blue cards, yeah, good place to be. This this on the this could just be amazing against Bobble. The fact that whenever your opponent plays a Bobble, you are bound to this grow or, or ping them. Yep, yep, exactly. I don't know. I just hope to. I hope it's as as much play as I expect of it. Mm -hmm. Well, well, uh, time will tell, and we'll keep our keep our fingers on the pulse there. And keep now. And now for the greatest, for the most powerful card in the set, Zack. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, 
one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. That flavor text appears, I believe, in the correct uh, black script of uh, what it was, uh, Mordor yes. on the one of one one ring that's floating around somewhere in the world. The regular copy of the one ring has no flavor text because it has too much text. And no engraving. So let's... Yeah, no engraving. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's funny. The engraving actually appears on other cards that like destroy the One Ring, but, but not, not on, on the, the one, one Ring, ring itself. itself. Yeah, it's cute. Um, so this card has a lot of text. Let's uh, get into this because uh, I've seen a lot of misplays and a lot of misconceptions about this card <laughs> already. So four mana, uh, legendary artifact, the One Ring, indestructible. When the One Ring enters the battlefield, if you cast it, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for each burden counter on the one ring. Tap, put a bar burden counter on the one ring, then draw a card for each burden counter on the one ring. So, uh, interesting to note that when you start using this, you don't lose any life until your next upkeep. So that's very, very interesting and powerful. Um, if you can untap it, that means you get to draw one card, then two cards, then three cards, then four cards which is obviously super, super powerful because then when you, if you have to actually get to that next turn, um, you'll only lose that highest number of life. You don't get dinged for every hit along the way. Hmm. Um, the other thing is, what is protection from everything? So you gain protection from everything, your permanents do not. Um, protection means damaged, uh, enchanted or equipped, blocked or targeted. So blocked doesn't apply, enchanted or equipped, normally doesn't apply to players um, there's a few curses and things like that so what we really boil this down to is damaged or targeted anything that tries to damage or target you will not be able to do so um so even non-targeted burn which does exist things like uh, chandra torch of defiance is a non-targeted burn spell uh, or burning damage ability uh or combat damage. None of that goes through. Um, but also things that target, like, oh, I don't know, Archon of Cruelty. Hmm. Um, but even more um, blasé things like Thoughtseize. You're just safe for that turn. So the One Ring gives you a card on that turn and then two cards on the next turn and buys you that one turn to use them. And I think as a default way to look at this as a four mana card, that's pretty damn good. Um, the immediate comparison in my mind is if you're playing a colorless deck, um, this is on that first turn, probably just straight up better than Mystic Forge. And that's crazy because Mystic Forge is so powerful as a card advantage engine. And it actually takes like several turns and a bunch of untapped mana for it to be able to keep up with this. Now, later in the game, if you have a glut of mana, yes, Mystic Forge can immediately uh, outvalue this, but... That's really impressive. So I'm I'm calling the one ring the best planeswalker ever printed after Oko. <laughs> yeah. Oko 2.0. And, and, that, and that's how I call and that's how I treat it. I don't think it's quite Oko levels because turn three over turn yeah. two with a mana orc is insanely different. Turn two on the play right. is super oppressive, while turn three you still have access to counter spell, you still have access to measures against it. Yeah, yeah. Cer certainly more so. However, um, the one thing resolves and it just takes over the game while being an indestructible artifact. Yeah, very, very quickly. Um, I will say my early conclusions about the One Ring uh, are, first and foremost, you want to be playing a deck that either produces a lot of mana, um, and this is a four-drop sorcery speed card in Modern, so there is a caveat. So if you produce a lot of mana... That's great because you can, first of all, get to the one ring, which costs four. So if you're kind of like ramping a little bit, that's a big deal. Uh, but secondarily, you need to make, you need to be able to play as many of the cards you're drawing as possible every single turn. So And that can take a lot of mana to play multiple two, three, four mana spells. Um, there is the possibility that you're a very low curve deck where everything in your deck costs one or two or even one or zero. The problem is decks like that don't really want to cast a four mana sorcery speed card that protects you, right? So uh, the joke going around was who's going to be the first person to 5-0 with the ring in burn? And it's like, yeah, actually, this is not a bad card at all for burn, except for the part where it's four mana. And traditionally, they don't want to get to having four mana. Either the game should be over. Yeah. And the kind of bilance stop you from that. 
Exactly, exactly. So the, the game should be over uh, by that point. But there are red mid-range decks, and I've seen a few of them being pretty successful with this card in it. So wait for the Emayashi four of the one ring uh, YouTube video for his thoughts on different ways to build that. So the first... He shouldn't take more than a few days. No, yeah. I mean, once he gets his hands on them, he actually buys every single card he plays. Like, he doesn't have a rental service, it seems like. Um, I mean, it's on brand. He's a so He really cares about budget. He's always well. He's always doing budget conscious brews. Like he yeah. has a bunch of trophies with Ragavan list decks, and he's like, "Well, it's not because I think that they're necessarily good. I just want to uh, prove or, it's or better. I just want to prove. Yeah, I want to just do it in every variation. He's. I think he's on a quest to get a five zero with like every single combination of four X of every single red card. Like no, just every possible permutation. No, I think he's real. He has a real task that he had said in the past, which is getting a five zero consistently with each of the f mono of the monocolor budget deck he has built. That's true. Like, for example, he, the other day he posted a 4-1 with the Obosh Mono Black rack that costs, like, six packs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's definitely someone to look into. M. Hayashi, or Magic Matt, uh, is his YouTube channel. So the first place I went with this was Mono Black Coffers. Um, this is the most updated list that I have a picture of here. Um, so Mono Black Coffers has been a deck that's been tickling my fancy as of recently. Um, so it is a big mana deck taking advantage of Cabal Coffers plus Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth. Um, this just ends up producing a gratuitous amount of mana. Um, it's like, it's not as big mana as a Tron deck. Um, usually on turn four, you're producing about five, if you're very lucky, six total mana. Um, the next turn, it could be seven, eight, or nine. The next turn, it could be, you know, 10, 11, 12. So it really, um, it's not quite as explosive as Tron, but what it does make up for is playing a lot of interaction. Um, you can lean that interaction in multiple different ways. Most versions are um, doing well in a way where you have a lot of early game interaction for things like Ragavans, DRCs, etc. Uh, and then you build up your mana into a bunch of big, heavy hitting payoffs. And the other thing that makes these decks quite successful is the eight field mana base four field of ruin four demolition field um this allows against other mid-range and controlling decks this allows you to have a kind of very inconvenient and inevitable plan of attack um that a lot of decks are just not built to deal with uh, if you've been wondering why you start seeing a single planes in the sideboards of indomitable creativity these are the kind of decks this is the reason why uh if they only have a mountain it can be disastrous for them to get hit by a field of ruin or demolition field early so um, with this being a big enough mana deck that you've uh, you was always already um, playing Karn as uh, usually its best payoff, and then there's been a rotating cadre of other payoffs. So Golos and a Cascading Cataracts has been popular recently. Um, Shieldred has been one before, um, but I bring up Shieldred specifically because Shieldred is phenomenal with the One Ring. Uh, there's a specific clause on Shieldred the Apocalypse, a card that Mord and I famously uh, thought was. Very, very underpowered, and uh, I think we were proven incredibly wrong just by straight-up results. Uh, or not that it was underpowered, it just wasn't interesting. But that doesn't matter sometimes. I think we, we, we ended up agreeing, yeah, this is likely good, but why is it so boring and called the Apocalypse? Right, right. So we've got a, a four mana, two black black for a four five death touch. And uh, she has two different triggers. One is whenever you draw a card, you gain two life. And the other is whenever an opponent draws a card, they lose two life. Um... Besides being a reasonably large body that is causing your opponent to die very quickly, if they don't immediately have an answer for this, she punishes them for trying to find one, right? Because she's making them lose life for each card yeah. draw. The synergy with the one ring is fairly obvious. Every time you draw a card, you're now gaining two life, which offsets the ring uh, making you lose life. Um, so that's just sort of a powerful engine in this deck. And then in playing these leagues, I found Shieldra to just be a pretty reasonable card in modern right now. Um, not great, not a slam dunk. I mean, it dies to Unholy Heat and it dies to a kicked Fatal Push, but it doesn't die to a Fury. Um, it can make uh, an inconvenient graveyard for living in sometimes. Uh, you'd be surprised at how quickly they put their life total really low. Um, 
So this deck is playing a combination of Cling to Dust, Fatal Push, um, Expedition Map to grab your lands, Nile Spell Bomb to control your opponent's graveyard, Night Whisper, uh, March of Wretched Sorrow is another great synergy piece with the one ring. Uh, this is X and a black. This is the March cycle, same as March of Otherworldly Light. Um, and it deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker, and you gain that much life. And you could pitch black cards out of your hand to uh, add plus two to the X. So the thing is, sometimes you get you know, flush with extra copies of Fatal Push you don't need, Cling to Dust you don't need, Shouldered that you don't need. Well, you can feed those all into your March of Wretched Sorrow for extra life gain, uh, besides the fact that it'll just soak up as much mana as you have to gain extra life. And the fact that it's Planeswalkers is super bad. Uh, and is in very good. Um, and then in this most recent version, which I haven't yet tested, I'm going to do so today, um, I've got three copies of O-Stone as uh, my sweeper of choice. The one great thing about this is it doesn't destroy your one ring because that's indestructible. Hmm. So when you find this, you can just fire it off immediately and clear your opponent's everything. Um, there are other versions of this deck playing things like Damnation. Um, sometimes Invoke Despair, I'm pretty off that card. It's I think it's a worse one ring. Yeah, and it's also just very medium minus as a removal spell or a wrath or a, it's not quite anything that you want it to be, if that makes yeah. sense. No, no, I agree. It just And it, it doesn't scale, right? Sometimes it's insane, like sometimes it's one right. of the few cards that can trade favorably with a fable and a Renan Six, but that's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basic. Kill your fable, kill your Renan Six draw card. Like that's pretty good for five minutes. No, mana, kill your but... creature, kill your fable, kill your Renan Six. Sure, clears, sure. Like, or every that. step. Yeah. But it's not a consistent use of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm interested to see how this one goes. I've gotten mostly four ones with these mono black coffers decks featuring the one ring uh, so far. And uh, I'm interested to see how these last couple of changes will, will treat that deck. Um, I have a screenshot included here from the first and only time I have gotten to activate Baradur when it was in the mana base. And Baradur. I made an 8-8 eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight orc army, which was pretty cool. Um, seems like the juice is not worth the squeeze with Baradur, but uh, still, it was worth trying uh, for a couple of leagues just to get a single screenshot of it doing a thing. And the world rejoiced uh, as we sang 17 man in Chorman land. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to skip over this next one, but for those interested, I did play um, a, a deck that I've been referring to as Unholy Tron. Um, this was first something I picked up from the 5-0s from Tron Specialist Tron Walker. So uh, it's like a half Prison Tron, half Eldrazi Tron deck um, that is sort of like just trying to hit Tron on turn three as much as possible um, because it's playing Serum Powder and all that. It's playing a lot of the Prison Tron elements, but it's also playing a Dr Eldrazi Temple, Thought Not Seer, uh, All Is Dust, and in his version he was playing Ulamog and uh, a copy of Emrakul in the main deck, which was wild. Um, for my mashup, um, I've got two empty slots because I cut some of the cards that I didn't like, but uh, trying the one ring in here, this was also great and was another... I think this was another 4-1. So it's just... You know, uh, one ring is just a great four mana payoff. Sometimes your Tron gets disrupted. Don't worry, the one ring will find you more copies of Tron. And later on here... Tron will keep troning. Exactly. And later on here, I have a green Tron list. Um, that one's from Aspiring Spike. That's his build of it. Um, just with the same theory of the one ring buys you time and it draws you cards. And um, that can, you know, complete your Tron and get you your next payoff. It's not easy to interact with, so it's just going to sit there and keep drawing you into gas. Uh, and as long as you can keep the game going, um, but not too long, then uh, you can do that. Um, I think at this point also it's worth noting that the One Ring being legendary is also awesome for you because when you draw a second copy of the One Ring, uh, if the number of burden counters on your first One Ring is getting unmanageable, you just play a new one, get another turn Fun. of protection from everything, and then you just have a brand new One Ring. And uh, it has zero burden counters on it, and you do what you will with that. Time to draw um, more cards. Yeah. Um, so that is incredibly good uh, for for the player playing it. It does feel like the One Ring should have a clause like you can't cast the One Ring as long as you control the One Ring, and you can't sacrifice the One Ring. Like those are two things that I feel like it should have, but that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, the next deck that is worth talking about, though, is uh, what was being hailed by Aspiring Spike as the place where this card is going to be broken and make a deck broken. It's 8-Key. Um, so this is a Dice Factory deck. Mord, have you ever played one of these? What is your history on Dice Factory? Tried it twice or thrice, had a decent result, did not feel like my kind of deck after I flopped to a few Force of Vigor. 
Right. Um, it's very much my kind of deck. I love this kind of uh, artifact nonsense. Um, I played it. Uh, I think this one ended up being a 3-2. Um, it is a very explosive, uh, but very volatile deck. You'll oftentimes have to mulligan to six or five, but you actually need quite a few pieces of cardboard uh, off the top to set up your engine and get going. And it's a deck that is very, very, very powerful. But besides being vulnerable to itself in that you need just the right number of things to go right, um, it's also incredibly easy to hate. Um, a single nature's claim, just blowing up one of these artifacts on like turn one can sometimes <laughs> have devastating effects on your turn sequence where you're just completely unable to recover. Yeah. Um, especially on a mulligan to six or five where it's just like, well, I have what I need, but if anything happens to any of these pieces, I'm really, really out of luck. Um, so the one ring was very good in this, and this is probably the most powerful place you could play it. However, I don't think it fixes any of the things that were fundamentally um, dangerous or like the reason that this isn't taking over the meta in any way is because it's so vulnerable uh, if people just bring the right pieces of interaction. Um, if these kind of decks are getting very popular um, and there's uh, the food decks we were talking about earlier have the same issue. Um, if people start playing copies of Brotherhood's End, uh, Crime Punishment, um, which is Force of Vigor, uh, which a lot of people are already playing, um, suddenly these look embarrassingly bad uh, hmm. in most games. Yeah. But when they look great, they look phenomenal. I mean, you can get some insane screenshots with these decks. Oh, um, they're, they're really screenshotable decks. I feel it yeah. works in a similar way to like um, the... The manufacturer decks, or they just start to exponentialize stupidly. Right. And when you draw the right things, like in the right proportion, you get lucky the right number of times, it can feel completely like bulletproof and unbeatable. Um, but uh, I, I would say uh, it's not yet proven to be a consistent contributor to the metagame. Um. Next up, a quick mention, um, just because my good friend, the Tunneling Cat, Etron expert and Pro Tour competitor, uh, the Tunneling Cat, uh, asked to borrow my copies of the One Ring today. And she said, uh, oh, I'm playing um, some Etron with One Ring. I want to see how that goes. Um, her uh, tournament report, such as it is, uh, I got, was that she got a 4-1 with it and only lost to uh, Creativity. Um Creativity is one of those decks, uh, same with blue-white control, that is set up to deal with the One Ring in that they have exile-based removal in their main deck, things like Leyline Binding and Prismatic Ending. So a um, little bit of bump, a little bump in the meta hmm. for those cards. Um, so this is like classic Etron, Matter Shapers, Thought Not Seers, Reality Smashers, Karn, Chalice, Walking Ballista, just playing three copies of the One Ring, one copy in the, uh, uh, th three in the main, one in the sideboard. Um, she is one of the best players in the world at playing this deck. I don't expect everyone who registers this to be able to get a 4-1 or be on the cusp of a 5-0, but... I have seen Gaia get 4-1s with the worst Etern list possible. So yeah. So take that uh, into account. Yeah, I don't think this with is a grain bad. Of no, it's not bad. And again, one ring is great in a Tron deck, right? Like, yeah. it just it just is. Like, it makes it easier to cast. And then once you have Tron and the one ring, like, you're just going to be vomiting value onto the battlefield. Um, so maybe this helps Etron just uh, nudge up a couple of notches uh, on the tier list. You know, maybe it settles back into being like more definitively tier two, whereas recently it's been kind of like two point five. If I'm going to use that term, where it's like if someone top thirty twos with Etron, I'm not shocked. But you're never going to see like, you know two or three challenge in results eights. in any given like two week period yeah a top eight would be insane uh, and yeah. it happens from time to time right that one person who top 32s maybe they top eight like yeah. some of the pilots are very very good at it um but it's not a deck that rewards you just for playing it i, I don't feel like it's a deck that has a deck advantage there's just very good players who love playing it um and so they can carry it to the highest height that the deck can manage yeah so and I, finally, no. Before yeah, we jump to that, I had a super yeah, fun yeah. idea with an Eldrassi Tron build that I didn't get together because I don't have the halflings yet. But we were talking with a friend about something like a 
Band or Simic Tron with four halfling, four boreal, toon, four boreal elf. Because we finally oh, have, uh, yeah, a, we finally have two places of a door that provides colorless mana. Yeah, what is the arboreal druid? Uh, well, it's just taking me to arboreal grazer if I search arboreal. Um, but I know who you're talking about. It's it's a single green for one one taps for snow mana. Uh, or it taps for a colorless, and it's a snow creature, so that is a snow mana. Um, yeah, uh, and and then of course the new delighted halfling, which taps for a colorless, or it taps for a colored mana that you can spend on legendary spells, uh, and it makes them uncounterable. Uh, and it's in our show notes here, it's a halfling citizen. Anyway, um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it could be mono green, right? Um, but it, what 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 are the blue Eldrazi, or what are the blue elements that you'd want to add to that? No, I'm not sure about if I want to add. Colorless Eldrassi, besides if I'm playing Celestia, like Eldrassi Displacer, which tends to be the better fitting one, it's only about having green for eight dorks and the one ring. I mean, able to cast the one ring and Karn and Contrable. Right, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, I would say float that idea to Kaya, and uh, she'll will. probably play it and get a 4-1 or a 5-0, because uh, I've seen her do it with red-green Eldrazi, mono-red Eldrazi, so she's definitely an uh, Eldrazi aficionado uh, in every sense of the word. Um, but there is one more frequently played modern mana engine that we haven't looked at yet, and you are not the only one to brew uh, a list like this, but it's four-color Omnath with four copies of the ring. Mord, what the hell? So I sent this abomination, I think, the day uh, the, the card got released, and then I saw Spike playing it today, so clearly I'm not the only one with the idea. But Delighted Halfling plus the one ring, and because, just because four color plays so many legendaries, like the Lighted Halfling just fits perfectly in allowing you to cast Ren and Six, the Fairy, Omnath, the One Ring, Elish Norn, all uncontrollable. Helps you by being an additional. Uh, actually, the first playable mana dog that doesn't die to Ren and Six. And the One Ring is just infinite gas in a deck that plays not only Solitudes, but Omnath in a way to. and the Fairy to bounce it in a way to not get destroyed by the. by the damage. Hmm. Yeah, it's a big deal in the modern format. Uh, and then, of course, the idea that, like, oh, Omnath gives you four mana. Well, what could you do with four? Well, you could use it to play the One Ring. Uh, but then also, if you play the One Ring on four, then on turn five, you can play Omnath into Fetchland, which is, you know, usually what you want to do with it. Um, and then, of course, the Halfling lets that happen on turn three, four, respectively, uh, if if you want that. But it also lets you cast a turn two to Fairy, like, awesome. Yeah, turn two the fairy just wins games, right? Turn two uncontrolled the fairy, even through a dispute or a spell pierce. I can imagine yeah, living. That's messed up. I can imagine how annoying that's for like living end. Yeah, that's gonna be gross. I'm I'm uh, I'm all about that. So force huh? negation this nerd <laughs> and turn two the fairy your way in. Not, not only that, but the red halfling is a must kill if you're playing control against this sort of thing. It's a mana dork that just wins the game. Yeah, yeah, it certainly can, uh, especially with the power of planeswalkers, which are all legendary, um, and then the specifically powerful legendary creatures that are in this deck. Yeah, that's um, definitely going to give you an edge in some matchups where you didn't have it previously. I think it might also hurt you in a couple of matchups, like um, just against like say coffers for example that's a deck that has a bunch of creature removal that's just like sitting around doing anything and there's just going to be some times where you keep a delighted halfling um hand quote unquote like where it's an integral part and it's like oh it got pushed uh this sucks but you can always sideboard them out for game two so yeah. you can just take them out if they're not needed and i'm still playing 23 lands which is a respectable amount so Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, Delighted Halfling even could be a reasonable card to play alongside Ragavan, um, because you can play it on one and then dash the Ragavan on two and then uh, play... Uh, you get you sort of an extra mana rebate, so if you hit uh, two cost off their deck, you'd be able to play it. Um, so that's interesting, too. Hmm. That's another yeah. way, yeah. So yeah. this is something I'm super excited to play. I have yet to have both Halflings and the One Ring in my possession at the same date. Uh -huh. So being a slightly late on that, but hope to do it by the by next week. Yeah, I was looking at mana traders. Uh, previously, when you added cards from Lord of the Rings, it didn't even have a price. It does now show you a price, and it seems to suggest to me that renting things may be coming up uh, soon. Um, 
actually let's let's try adding one right now yeah so it's grayed out right now i'm assuming i can't actually rent this uh, but i did get a notice that said like uh well things are just highly in demand so it might be like we our stock is fluctuating so oh, uh, yeah. rental services should start having these cards reasonably soon if you have a uh, high enough um subscription level so uh i would say we've gone through a lot of the great decks hmm. uh that are currently around that are using these cards however um, before we get out of here, I would love to hit some of these honorable mentions. Uh, Morton and I were talking before the show about there's already been a 5-0 uh, with these two cards, the same cost, one blue-red, one blue-red. Um, and this is Aspiring Spike 5 0 with a Snapcaster Mage, Flame of Anor, uh, kind of Blue Moon-ish deck. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable calling it actual Blue Moon because it's playing DRC and Bobble, so it's like it's not a controlling deck. This is more aggressive and tempo-y. It's kind of like uh, knockoff Merc. It's slightly more mid-rangey Merc Tide uh, without Merc Tides. Um, so Flame of Anor is an instant for one blue red. It says choose one. If you control a wizard as you cast a spell, you may choose two instead. Target player draws two cards. Destroy target artifact or deal five damage to target creature. Um, and personally, I feel like this card is just not quite good enough for modern. Morn? I think, uh, so the problem is not that the card is not good enough, it's that the wizards are not good enough, right? You think that's the problem? I don't know about that. I think if, if you are able to consistently get both effects, this should be great. Ah, uh, I don't know about great. I... I really don't know about great. The fact that that... So, in my mind, and this is the thing I wanted to bring up, this is comparable to Prismari Command... Archimedes Charm and Coligan's Command. Um, Prismari Command and Coligan's Command definitely have a, a lower ceiling. The best those cards can get is not as good as this can be. This can be better than either of those. However, they don't require a wizard in play. Um, and you're right. That, I think that maybe maybe that means that the wizards are the limiting factor, but they're just like having a Shatter Shock mode always available and then the other potential modes of those cards the other potential modes of those cards actually might be better than draw two cards a lot of the time and then for me archmage's charm has the literal counter spell mode and it also has the gain control of uh permanent or non land permanent with convert of oh, converted mana cost one or less so it just i just don't think that this is the right thing one of the things i was talking about was that you can't deal damage to planeswalkers with this yeah so that's there's super a bunch annoying. of matchups yeah, there's a bunch of matchups where this is just... It can only ever be draw two cards. That yeah. sucks. Yeah, that sucks. That's something I hadn't considered where sometimes it's just the best mode, but only the best mode. Right. Yeah. So that's a problem for me. Um, where Coligan's Command and Prismari Command don't have that problem, right? Um, and then Archimedes Charm certainly doesn't have that problem. Um, and then the other one is Gandalf Sanction. Spike was playing a bunch of these, and he said, oh, I had to play no uh, 29 instants and sorceries in my decks for this to be worthwhile. So what, what is this card? It's one blue-red sorcery. Uh-oh. Uh, hmm. Deal X damage to target creature, not creature or planeswalker, uh, not to a player, uh, where X is the number of instants and sorceries in your graveyard. Excess damage is dealt to the creature's controller instead. So there has to be a creature. This is yeah. like a trampling bolt. I, I can't even believe he was trying to play this card. It is, no, no. It, it's exactly it the kind of card that he would say, really, don't ask, because it's nowhere near good enough. It had to be an instant to be remotely playable, I think. That was, like, I, at least... I think it also needed the claws uh, in your graveyard or in exile, yeah. as the cards in Ravnica had. Beacon Bolt, etc. Um, it's just... There's just, like, a bunch of graveyard hate floating around all the time, right? And, like... I don't know, man. This this is just I can't. I I I mean, I'm pleased. I'm always happy when I see someone uh, who is as top tier at brewing and playing as that uh, playing a card like this. Don't be fooled uh, by the fact that it's showed up in a five O list. This is one of the worst cards in that list. Might be the worst card in that list. I think it's um, by, by 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 far. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, continuing down the honorable mentions, I've seen this in play a couple of times, and I understand why. So this is the Palantir of Orthanc. Um, this is that that big scary sphere that connects to the all-seeing eye in the movies, uh, and uh, so this is how Sauron communicates with uh, Saruman. Um, so 
Uh, it's a legendary artifact for three. It says, at the beginning of your end step, put an influence counter on the Palantir and scry two. Then, target opponent may have you draw a card. If that player doesn't, you mill X cards where X is the number of influence counters on Palantir of Orthanc, and that player loses life equal to the total mana value of those cards. So, I imagine the purpose of this, because I saw it in, in play um, when someone was playing against Green Tron, um, but I can imagine a bunch of different Karn slash artifact decks where the purpose of this is it keeps drawing you uh, gas while scrying, and your opponent very quickly is not going to be able to not let you draw the card um, when you're milling over, let's say, four or five cards and you're playing like a Tron deck or something like that. You're going to be hitting things that cost four, seven, maybe ten, uh, and that can very just quickly just kill someone. Uh I don't know if it's here to stick around, but it's certainly something that I'm interested people tr like. I'm interested that people are trying it. Hmm. All right, I, I I can get into that. Um, Stern scolding. I haven't seen this on the stack yet. No, uh, I've seen it. Not even in deck lists. I think just in I, concepts. Yeah, I I think I've seen it in a couple deck lists. I'm interested to see if this card ever actually ends up being anything. I think people are too afraid to try it right now. Um, so once again, single blue counter target uh, creature spell with power or toughness two or less. It does get a lot of the format, right? Like, and not like not a lot, a lot, but. A lot. The thing is, Spell Pierce is so universal. It's like there's almost no decks where it doesn't hit anything. Stern Scolding does have the downside of like there are some decks where it's like not like it hits very few things, and then also the things it's hitting are often irrelevant um, by the time that it lines up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm interested to see how this, how and if this ever finds a place in the metagame. I'm a, I, I think not. In the same, because in some matches you're just gonna start in disdain. Right. My friend was trying to sell me this instead of um, steward denial in like the Bantel Rush we were talking about, just because it comes with solitude for one mana. Yeah. No. I mean, again, countering Yogmoth for one mana. Awesome. Like, holy crap. That that's fantastic. Counter yeah. grief for one mana. Yeah. It fantastic. Has a lot of amazing counters. A but season they... Pyromancer. And then, of course, Ragavan DRC. Um, and then weird ones like Walking Ballista. Like, this counters everything in scales. Every single creature in scales gets countered by this card for one mana. Right? That's yeah. awesome. Every um, single creature by, by a... And I'm thinking... Like, in most matchups, it does something. It counters Triad and Gracer out of Titan. Right. That, but, that's what I'm saying. Is But like then it's, you reach, like, creativity and it just... That's, that's literally right, nothing. Right, but... But Spell Pierce has the same problem, right? I just think that Spell Pierce has slightly right. more application in its bad matchups, right? Whereas this one in its bad matchups is like almost nothing. But yeah, again, also drawing this I, in I a matchup like Living End or such is there was it's a lot worse than drawing Spell Pierce against humans, I think. Yeah, I mean, I maybe I can agree with that, but then also like there's also other cards that are useless against Living End that people play all the time. People play Lightning Bolts, right? And I understand that this isn't Lightning Bolt. I get it. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. like I, no, I'm surprised I, think... I haven't seen it yet. Um, and you will see this card, and I'm interested to see what it ends up doing. Yeah, I it, if it appears, it means likely that creativity is gone, and I would be super excited for that outcome. So bring it yeah. in. <laughs> Next, we have a beautiful title by Zach. All yeah, the I didn't put cyclers. the I didn't put the individual in, in, uh, images in, but there's a full cycle of land cyclers uh, that all cost a single generic mana to cycle for their respective land. Um, importantly, it's not basic land cycling; it's lands it's forest cycling. So forest cycling can get you any triome or any shock land. Um, and the specific application, uh, I saw someone send a deck to Aspiring Spike today um, where they put their land count down to an insane, like, 14 in a living end list. And what they were able to do with it is um, uh, um, have the red, the black, and the blue land cyclers so that they could play um, four grief, four fury and four or three main deck uh, force negations and all three of those had enough cards to pitch to them um so i have no idea if that's a viable way to do this um but uh there you go so um i mean living in 
Living End got a 5 ball with 14 lands. Yeah. So it's just the beginning of the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm excited to see how that goes for those psychos who choose to keep playing Living End. Hmm. Um, and Fury in Living End is phenomenal. Right, I mean, there's this a slam dunk. If you can, if you could play Fury more consistently in Living End, I could really see Fury, it a lot. A hundred percent. Yeah, it yeah. would be insane if it was somehow consistent. Right, uh, and it, maybe, maybe it can be. Hmm. And then finally, uh, Reprieve, uh, one in a white. Uh, this is essentially the white remand, um, with the addition that it is better than remand because it doesn't have to counter the spell. So you can Reprieve things that are uncounterable. Uh, remand can't do that. Yeah, uh, you can cast Remand. Uh, and you will draw, just a, draw card. a card and nothing will happen. Yeah. Um, I, again, a card I haven't seen yet, but it is one of those things that is just like solitude decks want more white cards in them. Um, some solitude decks are slow and kind of mid rangey. This is a card that buys you time for you to set up your engines and stuff like that. You can, was, you can counter, you can counter for Supreme Verdict. Oh, oh, was yeah. he? I, I didn't see that. But uh, you can counter Supreme Verdict with this. That's a big deal for some white decks, right? So I would expect to see this. Um, it's easier on colors for some variations of creativity. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I would expect to see this card. This this is going to come up. Yeah, I, I, this, I think this is going to see play. You're going to see this card from time to time. Maybe a Hammer player will pick it up. This will get cast against you, especially if you're playing some sort of combo that can be delayed. Yeah. And that's that's it for my list of honorable mentions. Uh, if I missed anything that is your favorite card that you really love that you want to talk about, make sure that you can tweet at us uh, at Faithless Brewing Pod on Twitter. Uh, you can, uh, of course, if you're in the Discord, direct message any of the hosts. We're all in there um, from time to time, or just hop in the epi episode discussion thread or the modern thread and just start kicking ideas around with all the people in there. So, my good friend Emmy, what uh, what is the next couple decks you're going to be playing out of the list we had here? I know you mentioned some of them, but let's just recap that real so quick. So as soon as I get some Bone Masters, I'm going straight into Flash. That's the thing I'm most excited for, see if that deck is finally good enough to get a few 5-0s. Mm -hmm. Then I have to finish the league I have with... Actually, before that, due to logic reasons, I have to finish my league with some food. That's I'm actually 3-0 right now with the Daredevil one. So just mm. going full Asmo, Samwise, good stuff. And Very then nice. I get, and then some four color with the ring, maybe even some Boros Valiant stream, just because I I really love playing Goblin Engineer and I hope I someday find a decent deck for it. Yeah, yeah, I love a uh, good Goblin Ex Engineer deck. Um, so even if it's you know they're never they've never been great, but they are always fun. Um, so excited about that. Uh, for me, I'm going to continue working on all sorts of one ring decks. Uh, I'm definitely going to be playing more of this mono black coffers deck uh, just to see how good I can get it. And then uh, I've got a variation of like a prison Tron deck that I haven't touched yet that we'll be playing the one ring or we go maybe revisit the nightmare Tron list that's playing the one ring. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun with that card. It seems to be really, really up my alley uh, in terms of play patterns. So uh, from all of us here, and I'm sure our uh, CEO in absentia, uh, have yourself a great week. Let us know what you think about these decks, and we will see you folks next time. Emmy, I'll see you later. Have a lovely night, everybody, and see you around. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Faithless Brewing. If you enjoyed this program, you can join our family at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Your contributions help us bring you freshly brewed episodes every week, but they'll get you Discord access, show note access, merch, and so much more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. We now return to Old Men Try to Remember Card Names. What does this make me think of? Um, uh, the, the rogue. No, rogue. Uh, the creature. Which rogue? Play it enigmatic. Rogue? Not rogue. Re refiner, rogue, rebel. Rebel? Ah. The enigmatic creature. Three, one green, white, three, two. Renegade Rallyer. Revolt. Renegade Rallyer. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. It's like a steel. I it's... knew it was all ours. I knew it was all ours. Uh, yeah, so Renegade Rallyer. This is very reminiscent of Rally Renegade Rallyer to me. Oh, except with Flash.